Oh my God, we are back for yet another episode of Grindhouse Chic. As always, we are with Brian Baldwin and the most current member of the Hair Club for Men, <laughs> Matt Armstrong. Matt, <laughs> Matt, are you like now in a toupee of the month club? I got a name. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's amazing. No, I just, I just decided to not wear a hat today. <laughs> Dude, did you did you did you stop by the wig emporium? <laughs> I stopped by uh, Amazon. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Dalton! Thank you for joining us. This is amazing. I, I had no idea. That's not even the same hair as Dalton. That's Dalton, the closest I could get. I, that's a spinning image. That's it's got the side. It's got the side part. <laughs> you, you, you look like the mom on a nineteen fifty six. It is definitely uh, longer than, than it looked in the picture. This makes me want to watch that episode of Seinfeld where George goes wig shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is funnier because we know Matt. <laughs> True. Oh my this god! Is, this All is right, so but... hard because my camera is reversed. <laughs> yeah, um, Brian just texted me that your 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 hairpiece has given him a chub. <laughs> Ooh, nice. <laughs> you know what the sad thing there's, is, is if there's a lot of if there's a lot of shaky cam over here just ignore it <laughs> this is what well, my hair used to look like actually i i <laughs> I, I, I heavily doubt that <laughs> it, it for real did <laughs> all right <laughs> very sad story so Aww. before before we go and talk about roadhouse um i was i guys i don't know if you know this about me but i'm i'm very much read the news every day and there was an article, it was either on Slate or Salon, about how the Looney Tunes movies are disappearing off HBO Max. And it goes on to say how all the DVDs and Blu-rays of Looney Tunes are out of print and cost a crap load of money. And I'm basically, basically it came out saying, without saying, that physical media is still the best way to consume movies but on the flip side we are seeing films that are ne have never been released on physical media that go straight to streaming what what are your guys thoughts have we reached a tipping point where physical media is once again going to be in vogue or are we going to be going through a drought where less and less is going to be released by the mainstream studios and we're going to have a hard time finding it unless we already own it. Um, I mean, I, I feel like it's, I feel like it's coming back and showing it's showing its place here. I, I read an article recently too um, about Netflix in general that said um, they're just perpet perpetually losing money at all times. Like they put these huge budgets into their like Netflix movies and, they're never making the money that they put into them, but they're just always like cycling debt and cycling debt. So they, this article was saying that streaming services like that, like definitely have a shelf life on them. So I, I think it's, I, I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's coming back. But we're, we're seeing stores like Best Buy, Target and Walmart continually dec decreasing the shelf space or in some cases eliminating Mm -hmm. physical media altogether yeah I do yeah when we were we were in target yesterday and as i was telling robert matt before you hopped on here with us i, I picked up pearl because i'm the one to grab that and it, it is like it's substantially smaller than even when i was in there i think like a month ago maybe so it's like half of what it was then now so now we just basically have one stand four sides to it and like one section of a shelf mm -hmm. and that oh god it just it's depressing it's so sad to me to go and see that but I, I do have a question actually that i have i've just never really given any thought and obviously i know i can do some research and find out the answer but for sake of conversation how do how does streaming actually bring in money for these companies like how does that work well, it, it's kind of altered in the past year because there are plans on Netflix and HBO Max where you can buy spend less on it per month, but you'll be you'll see ads during the films. So they're now trying to do an ad revenue model, mm -hmm. but 
if you're like me, I will spend the money not to watch ads, especially if it interrupts a film. Like it's like when I watch something on Tubi, I, I want to smash my head in because the commercials come in at the worst possible place, sometimes right in the middle of a scene. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess I, I realize my question might sound kind of stupid. I mean, I know that like people obviously pay for these monthly subscriptions and stuff, but in the long run, it just doesn't really seem like it would be enough money to continue to put out original content like consistently, which which they are. So maybe I'm just dumb to it, and they're like, yeah, making that's, way more than I. Would that's kind of what that article said. I mean, there are like there are outliers, like Stranger Things, for example. You know, made ton of money on toys and. Um, yeah, merchandise. They have like a big yeah. Lego deal and stuff like that, but yeah, they're putting like they sunk a ton of money into those like that one with Will Smith where he was like hunting fantasy creatures. Bright, I think. Never saw it. Yeah, I mean it was decent, but it. sunk a ton of money into it. Um, and they don't receive like theatrical releases. They don't usually receive any kind of physical media release, so it's kind of you know banking on just subscription costs and 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 ad space if 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 anyone does that well so I there mean, is one exception to that that i, I thought of too and, and i think this is the first one that i have seen do it uh, unfortunately we didn't get to catch it in theaters but glass onion that was a netflix feature and it, it spent it was only in theaters for one weekend like a couple mm-hmm. of days um we just watched it on netflix yesterday but um i think that's the first one i've seen i've seen it advertised in the theater like hey you know one weekend only I've no there, there, there were a few the, the, the <laughs> one with jonah hill that came, that was on netflix last year about that political county movie that which name i can't remember oh was that in was, theaters I, okay. um I same thing with the adam driver movie white noise that just came on netflix was also in theaters they they, they do this for their for their oscar consideration films Mm. what but is this one with adam driver i'm not familiar with it It just came out like new year's eve it's, like it's called white noise okay but but the thing is like a lot of these things as you said aren't getting physical media releases like none of no, nothing from amazon prime that has been a i'm let me say most things from amazon prime that are basically straight there or produced by their studios like Brittany runs a marathon the Mindy Calling movie where she was a writer on a late night show um, have never gotten physical releases. And I know the movie we're at Roadhouse that we're talking about today, the remake of that is going to be an Amazon Prime original. So that'll mm-hmm. never get a physical release either, at least not in the States. Um, none of the Disney Plus shows, again, let me say, rephrase it. Most of the Disney Plus shows, for, like the Marvel or Star Wars, there have been no physical releases for those. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm, I'm kind of worried about that because the next series of Doctor Who, the next Doctor Who is now going to be a Disney Plus exclusive in the States. And I collect those, I collect everything Doctor Who like there's no tomorrow. I'm worried that my physical media collection of the modern Doctor Who era just ended with the release of the power of the doctor Hmm. because for some reason disney plus doesn't want their stuff out there right but i'm also hoping because it's bbc that and disney doesn't own it that there still will be so that that's that's my worry and at some point again i you you have to look like with physical media you got to look at, all right, I have HBO Max. I watch this. I watched it a good percent of the time. I have Netflix, and I only watch it when there's a show on there that I want to see. Mm-hmm. And same thing with Disney Plus. Only when there's a show on there I want to see. Or when I watch an occasional episode of Boy Meets World. <laughs> but no, it's it, it's it's getting to, it's reaching a tipping point of also is the content on the streaming services really the stuff I want to watch like when I look at my when I look at my physical media collection 
I tend not to buy stuff anymore that is easily streamable. Yeah, I guess I I if if there's something that I want to buy or something new comes out from you know, say one of the partner labels, for example, that we don't get with our sub, I'll, I'll just buy them. I don't even think to like look on a streaming service. Well, dude, I should I mean, you, you should because <laughs> like a lot, like White Reindeer is was easily streamable. Um, Summer of Blood was streamable. I mean, that was, was on Netflix for the longest time. Mm-hmm. Um, like a lot of the more modern films, except from the stuff from your your challenge like from connie isn't streamable at all right in fact a lot of the vinegar well no that's not true like a lot of the vinegar syndrome movies that are released these days you can find elsewhere easily Mm -hmm. online yeah and if you have the um the arrow streaming service they they've put like four vinegar syndrome collections on there now um a lot of it's like older stuff nothing none of the new releases but so it's being represented somewhere at least but does the arrow channel have the extras on there um i don't think so no i think the i think the movies that arrow puts out they put some extras on but none of the vs ones i don't think all right yeah i i haven't i i haven't figured out it hasn't been worth it for me to subscribe to the Aero service. I, I subscribed to too much already. Yeah, same. Yeah, I, I have contemplated uh, maybe getting rid of a couple because I have like some additions that I never use, like AMC Plus. I never use. I have that as like an add-on through my Prime and uh, Screenbox. I do like Screenbox, okay, but I still I don't really find myself on there that often. Anyway, all of that to say, I have thought about maybe trimming some of those down and, and trying out Aero. Um, it seems like I might spend a little bit more time on there than I do some of the others. Yeah, yeah they they put all of their new era releases on there. I like mm. I, I like Shutter quite a bit because mm-hmm. they they have some unique stuff on there, and now they have a lot of the Severance stuff and Arrow stuff as well. Yeah, Shutter is um, awesome. I'll I'll never get rid of that. Well, you might never get rid of it, but who knows if it'll be around a year from now. Or if it's it better Joe, be, man. I, I need my Joe Bob Briggs. <laughs> I've, I've I've heard I've heard rumors that it's going to be merged into AMC Plus. Hmm. Gotcha. Which would make sense because they own it. Um. So before again, before we get into and I think so I saw I was watching a video the other day released um from this guy slip cover bullet Blake guy who loves slip covers. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a video out there called Severn Black Friday Unboxing. The twist was he didn't buy anything from Severn because he went on a rant about the Four Flies 4K and how it was a slip cover and not a slip case, how it was 50 some dollars. And basically, that was the reason. And I got a little mad because we have a contingent of collectors who put the packaging over the movie. And and where do you guys stand on that? I mean, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I, I'm not as bad as I used to be on it. I I will start off by saying that. Um, used to i did i wanted well if i can get the best packaging then i will but now if it becomes unavailable i am okay with a standard edition that's the best way to put what i was what i was going to say i'm not going to go out of my way to pay aftermarket prices for something just to get that big ass beautiful box anymore you know what i mean if for no other reason i mean it's it's becoming an issue with space now where i'm like fuck man i don't want to I don't have room for the shit. <laughs> um, so that that's where I stand on it. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm pretty similar. If, if I mean if it's if the option is there, I obviously want the best the best version of it. Um if I have the choice to to choose between the two, but yeah, I don't think that I've 
done any like eBay or, or aftermarket stuff to, to pay a lot of money to get these things. I, I've done eBay twice, uh, once for the Dawn of the Dead set and once for the Demon set. But the thing is, the movie is still the most import- important part. Like, mm-hmm. I I don't care that the Severn one doesn't match the Arrow and, and Synapse uh, Argento sets. I don't give a f- right about that. I'm just happy that I have a great version of the movie. And you know what? I know Roadhouse was around 50 some dollars. It's priced around 50 some dollars. And it has a beautiful it has a beautiful case that it comes in like all the VSUs. Mm-hmm. But in the end it's the movie that matters. No, nothing else. Sure. I mean, I do think it's fair to mention, though, that, you know, with some of these, it's not just simply, oh, it looks nice. You know, I mean, take Roadhouse, for example, you got a nice thick book in there full of all sorts of info and stuff like that. You know, so you are getting, in most cases, I, I think I can justify the price for them when you get, you know, like, like Second Sight. I love their releases. You know, you get so much stuff uh, that's fun to have. And some of it's little novelty things that I, like, I, I really don't care that much about, like, the lobby cards that come with a lot of these. They end up just kind of sitting there for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but. He, he, also, he also went on to say, like, you know, this is why we buy boutique stuff. It's for the slip covers. I, 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 I mean, I can I honestly say that. Criterion was the first, you know, boutique label that I started collecting. They don't do slip covers. Mm-hmm. Um, Code Red barely did slip covers. It's it's just about the movie, and yes, some of these things you can stream, like a lot of the Criterion stuff, you can stream on their channel or HBO Max. But you're not getting the whole package. You're not getting the bonus content. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'll say this: I'd much rather have more bonus content than a slip cover. Sure. Now I, I will like just to kind of compare a couple, and and I don't want anything I'm about to say to like you know people collect whatever they're into. I wouldn't, I would never bash anything like that. For me personally, though, like I could at least justify the collectability of the Vinegar Syndrome slip covers because the quality is so nice. Now you put that in comparison to something like Scream Factory, where people pay these absurd, absurd aftermarket prices just just to have the slip. And in my opinion, they're so cheap, they're super flimsy. There's no new art. Where I, I personally, I don't get that one at all. I'm like, oh, why I mean, in the uh, world uh, are people spending like a hundred dollars to get, you know, whatever with with the slip on those? But, but mm-hmm. even now, the vinegar <clears throat> syndrome. Prime stuff, those slip covers are, are, there's no real value to them because there's so many of these discs out there compared to again at the beginning when they were doing a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand print runs. It's why mm-hmm. most of the uh most of the, the 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 partner labels are now the cl- highly collectible because they're still so Less down there. Qualities. Yeah, mm-hmm. oh. sure. I did want to ask too because I, I didn't really fully understand the wording on it. So regarding vinegar syndrome with the uh, rewards program they have now, what is this about? Like earning a certain amount of points and then getting a slip cover? You can spend you can spend you know the I'm... you can spend the points on reprinted slip covers that are slightly altered. Okay, so they are all okay. Okay, yeah. That was my main question. Are they just gonna? You know, oh hey, I want a, a blood hook slip. You know, then um, my, my, my okay. goal is to assume enough points over the next couple of years, where it'll pay for a subscription. <laughs> there you go. Because that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, it's that's that's the plan. Oh I mean, gosh, I, I I wish they retroactively gave you points for. If you were a subscriber since the beginning, 
Yeah. Because then yeah. I'd be, then I'd be able to use that to buy my next subscription. <laughs> um, yeah, let's talk about the the movie that we that Matt spent money on it to pay for. How how much <laughs> did you spend on that? It was like fifteen bucks. Man, you could you could you could. It looks pretty it. legit. You could buy a movie it looks with good. that. <laughs> I see. Also, so uh, I also see you wear. <laughs> Wearing the double deuce T-shirt. Yep. Jasper, Missouri. All right. <laughs> That's all we got. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I will read the description of this film once I pull it up because I did not pull it up. I mean, if you haven't seen Roadhouse, you're obviously not a film fan all right roadhouse james dalton is a tough as nails bouncer with the reputation for using any and all force necessary to keep the peace meanwhile frank tileman a country businessman is having trouble maintaining maintaining control control over the violent patrons and crooked staff at his newly acquired club, the Double Deuce. Upon learning of Dalton's take-no-prisoner's prisoner, attitude towards security, he makes a proposal too good for Dalton to refuse, summoning him from the Big Apple to Jasper, Missouri, and handing him the reins to the bar on the promise that he clean the place up. But no sooner than his first few days in charge does he wind up stabbed in the hospital with the knowledge that he's up against a gang of thug, thugs who play even dirtier than he does. Dalton throws caution to the wind and prepares for a fight that will inevitably send someone six feet under. Patrick Swayze, Kelly Lynch, Sam Elliott, and Ben Gazzara headline an all-star cast in director Rowdy Harrington's blockbuster turn cult classic Roadhouse. Now there is a name they're forgetting on there. Harry Funk, who I say is the real star of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty good. He's great. <clears throat> so all right. So let's start out at the beginning. Dalton is working at a club that is not in Manhattan, <laughs> that is probably on Long Island, longer Staten Island, where they had a really bad, cheesy rock band. Um, <laughs> he the bandstand. What? The bandstand. Yep. He does get <laughs> stabbed, and then when, when this guy goes, I've always, been, I've always wanted to have a piece of you, Dalton, as they step outside and Dalton walks away. Then he is approached by a businessman who, in my opinion, was best known for playing Roy on the hit TV series Emergency and is John Locke's con father dad or con, con artist father on Lost. All right, John Locke's con artist father on Lost <laughs> um, is, is the owner of the Double Deuce. Did you call him a con father? I, yeah, I did. I did. I did. I mean, from trauma, the Godfather. <laughs> no, but it. I, and he and he does make an offer that's way too good to be true. Yeah, that mixed with like his just very slimy persona. He's just so. I, I don't know his facial expressions of the entire movie just got under yeah. my skin. I'm just like. Ugh. What's this guy really in, thinking? He walks in with a bolo tie on. <laughs> but, 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 but Dalton just, just quit. But Dalton just quits the best way possible. The, the manager or owner of the bar comes in and starts yelling at him to do something. And he's like, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His work there is done. That place is running <laughs> good. You know, money's coming in. Everybody's dancing. Yep. <laughs> They have an amazing. He's like, I kick about as much ass as I can here. I'm just, I'm just 
He probably said, you know what? I'm going to kick a lot of ass in Jasper, Missouri. <laughs> so then he goes, he drives his car, gives it to a bum, and then gets his Mercedes out of storage and drives to Jasper because he doesn't fly too dangerous. <laughs> It's just great, great timing on that on that delivery too. Yeah, perfectly straight faced. <laughs> then he moves to Jasper and walks into the double deuce, where immediately we see fights, drug deals, <laughs> Terry Funk, former. NWA wrestler, tag team champion, <laughs> ECW champion, kicking ass and taking names. And then he tells Dalton, if you're not drinking, you're out of here. But it also seemed like half the staff knew who he was. Like Dalton has this huge reputation mm -hmm. in the bouncer underground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. I think I think we had talked about that before, where how this movie kind of posits that there's a a huge community of uh, of like bouncers. Like there's a part later where he calls Sam Elliott and he's like, "Hey, I heard you're working down in Jasper." He was like, "How did you know this? This is the first time you're talking to him." <laughs> Well, the waitress immediately knew who he was. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I, I bet you there was some warning from the owner that this guy was coming down here. Right. But, <laughs> oh, <laughs> during that scene where one of the bouncers was, was talking to a girl there, I get off at 2. I want to get you <laughs> off by 2.30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that you know what, that, 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 that isn't too far line. off from a go ahead that pickup line has never worked for me <laughs> that's how i landed my wife so well how often do you wear <laughs> unbuttoned flannel shirts with no, nothing underneath every fucking night <laughs> <laughs> every fucking night <laughs> then dalton has a staff meeting i'm sorry he then goes buys a car has a staff meeting, finds a place to live for a hundred dollars a month with no air conditioning. And let me tell you, I lived in Missouri. I lived in Kansas City. Summers there suck. You need air conditioning. <laughs> and then we also I'm get our fir our first yeah. hint of Ben Gazzara as the the helicopter riding bad guy, the leader of the town. Um, during the staff meeting, he fires Terry Funk, who he, they do give a severance to, and Terry Funk immediately just starts getting it in his in Dalton's face. At that point, I started yelling "EC Dub, EC Dub, EC Dub." <laughs> <laughs> um, he also fired a waitress for dealing. Um, we also oh, we also know Dalton doesn't drink. Except coffee. Well, yeah, he does. Uh, he he has some he has some brewskis later on. Yeah, when he's not working with Sam Elliott and the Doctor Kelly Lynch. Yeah. Then the movie gets even more interesting. He does get stabbed. Um, he does fire a bouncer for for having the sex in the back room where he delivers his second greatest line, I'm on break. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stay on it. Isn't that what he says? <laughs> At some point he gets summoned. Oh, after he uh, fires the bartender for stealing, mm -hmm. he goes and visits Ben Gazzara. And that's where we learned that this guy, he came here in the 50s. He basically built this town. He brought the 7-Eleven in. He brought the mall in. He brought, and then he was bringing in a J.C. Penney's. And that really puzzled me because in every mall, there's always a J.C. fucking Penney's. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was one of the most uh, weird 
lines I've ever heard come from a villain. He just sounds so <laughs> it's, he sounds so insecure. He's like he's like he's like Christ. They're bringing J.C. Penney's here because of me. Ask anyone; they'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you you would think a town like Jasper would be more excited about a Kmart than a J.C. Penney's. Mm-hmm. But he probably brought that in too. Um, he's also a terrible driver. Just <laughs> acting like he owns the road while while singing along to 1950s music. And he is he does employ a great deal of the thugs in the town. <laughs> because he has an army of them and they do like to party. Mm-hmm. And he also says his, his girlfriend who he hits is in love with Dalton as well. Let's see. Then he holds up the liquor, um, starts the a fire at the uh, at the at the uh, the Napa Auto Parts store that is <laughs> right next to the bar. Um, destroys the. Uh, <laughs> The Ford dealership. <laughs> oh because, God, yeah. Because because his men own a monster truck, which I think is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, the bartender that he <laughs> fired was was his nephew, and they come in and try to fight for his job back. That's where Dalton gets stabbed, and he goes meets his lady love, the doctor, who is the nephew of the guy who owns the Napa Auto Parts. Um. Then Sam Elliott, his mentor, comes to town to try to help stop this. He gets stabbed. Um, Then we come to possibly the greatest fight after the home of the guy he's renting his barn from is blown up, where where the bad guy says, the greatest line in cinematic history, <laughs> I used to fuck guys like you in prison. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wonder if the line was originally supposed to be, I used to fuck up guys like you in prison. <laughs> 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 they kept telling him, they're like, like, you said the line wrong. He's like, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I, I am forgetting. We also learned something happened in Memphis that Dalton killed a man. Mm-hmm. And it might have been because he was seeing a woman who he didn't know was married, which means it was self defense. And then he basically, him, the old the old guy, the old guy from the Ford dealership, mm-hmm. the, the owner of the property he's renting. And the Napa Auto Parts store come in and basically kill Ben Gazzara's character. The police show up after the guns go missing, and they're like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and then the only thug that survived, the fat one, said, A polar bear, bear fell on me. <laughs> I loved that guy, by the way. He looked so familiar, but I couldn't place where I've seen him before. You know, have you? Have you watched Cobra Kai on Netflix? Uh uh-uh. did you see the black Spike Lee's The Black Klansman? Yes. He reminds me of the father of the the fat dumb guy from that movie. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that guy just won a golden globe for something the other day. But no. Oh really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Roadhouse is a near perfect movie. <laughs> yeah. I I've, I've got to I've got to agree. Um <laughs> I do have some questions about it. Keith David is like the fourth or fifth highest build credit. Mhm. And basically he is just a background player where his only line that we hear is they're almost low on liquor or whiskey. Yeah, so they're there is a rumor that there is a there was a cut of the movie where he had a more predominant role um and i i was watching all the interviews on the on the uh, special features yesterday 
and they were saying that this the first cut of this movie was like three hours long they ended up cutting out like 40 40 minutes a bunch of characters got cut out so i think that he i think he had something more going on yeah you don't Mm. hire the the second greatest character from they live (laughs) and the stepdad from there's something about mary (laughs) (laughs) To just yeah. be a background player. Yeah. I would love to see a three hour cut of this movie. I know. I would I would I could really go for some like Memphis flashbacks. I, I think maybe that's mm. maybe seems like a more logical reason as to how everyone knows him. If they've heard of some bouncer just ripping people's ripping someone's throat out on TV or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I it's kind of like the John Wick universe, in my opinion, where bouncers <laughs> are just held to a higher standard than most people. Mm-hmm. But what, what what gets me for this movie is, first of all, this movie is just a straight up high budget exploitation film. It it has all the elements of one. I mean, if the, if this was made 10 years earlier and starred Steve Rousback, it would still be a classic mm-hmm. because it has explosions, it has fights, it has murder, it has a, a little bit of nudity, I think it has some nudity, and it oh, has... Yeah. And it has a mysterious character who they could have set up for sequels where Dalton goes from bar to bar Mm -hmm. and gets into trouble. He was like the blue collar James Bond. (laughs) It's it's also billed as a as like a modern Western as well, which I can which I can definitely see in there, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Some guy coming to town to save it from the evil lord um yeah he's like clint eastwood man with no name but with a name yeah (laughs) but i i also think that it works so well um because it was produced by joel joel silver i mean it's that guy knows what he's doing sometimes (laughs) (laughs) but that was like a big a big thing they were talking about it's like they don't they don't know if this movie would have had the the um i don't know the the look or the star power or anything that made it what it was if if he wasn't on board but correct me if i'm wrong this movie was a failure when it was released theatrically i can see that yeah i think it was and it, i mean I, I didn't see it in the theater i saw it on hbo or when i was a kid mm-hmm. yeah that that i don't know I mean, th- this was the perfect VHS movie. You'd go to Blockbuster and there'd be a hundred copies of it. And you're like, eh, why not? <laughs> yeah, my first experience with it was um, me and my brother were kind of just going through my parents' uh, VHS tapes and they, they would always get blank ones and just record stuff off HBO when they were doing like the free weekends and stuff. And we just so happened to see this on there. We watched it once, and I think we probably watched it every day after that. <laughs> yeah, I can tell that you modeled your life after Dalton, exactly. and by that, and by that, I mean you killed someone in Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what what was what's really interesting about this movie is almost all of the main characters are pretty fleshed out. Mm-hmm. We know the doctor is there because she grew up there, left, and came back to help take care of her uncle who took care of her. Um, Ben Gazzara came there when this town was nothing and helped build it up. Uh, The guy who owned the Double Deuce, he bought it because he had a vision of it, and I could see that vision was probably franchising them out all over the place because when it got a a spanking brand new logo halfway through the movie. They got rid of the cage for the Jeff Healy mm-hmm. band. 
And I gotta tell you, I'm not a fan of I'm not a fan of Jeff Healy. I'm not really a fan of blues music, but man, he was perfect in that role. The blind mm-hmm. guy who gave us a ton of exposition yeah. <laughs> on the history of Dalton. <laughs> yeah, I like when it's just like something something happens and it either makes people like run outside or run to some other part of the bar. And someone just asks the question and the camera cuts over to him just standing there out of nowhere. And he's like, it's don't. And her, <laughs> That's the don't. Name, yeah, the name's, yeah. the name's uh, Wade Garrett. <laughs> like, who brought you over here? <laughs> and why was the band there for so long? <laughs> that, that might be just something clubs did back then. They just had a house band, maybe. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yes. yeah, that is, I really liked seeing that like shitty building morph into like seeing the success of it put into the building as the movie went on. I did really like that. What 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 I wonder is how come they didn't show the open mic comedy night that was there every Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was just Morgan up there. <laughs> And I and I told him he had a balls big enough to come in a dump truck. <laughs> uh, also I, I a did, weird line. But what I also love is the bouncers never patted anyone down for weapons, even even though they knew that was a problem. Mm-hmm. Like when the girl was dancing on the table, and Dalton basically, you know, gave him the signal to go over there and deal with it. Guy pulls out a knife. And then, you know, that's where I guess you stop being nice. Mm-hmm. I, um, I did love that whole thing because, you know, you had just given that speech of, <laughs> of you know, be nice, like blah, 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 until you until you can't be or something like that. I, I loved it, man, when he slammed that fucking dude's face into that table. It was so cool. I, I just, yeah, I loved that whole little bit. It, it's <laughs> a fun fact that I read online somewhere that they used, some police departments actually used that to train their police force that whole speech i saw that too and it it made me feel like real shitty because of the the instance that led to it it was the whole like guy and eric uh garver garner the like i can't breathe situation that happened in new york city and then when that happened they were like oh we got to use this scene from roadhouse so our police I, was, I, I wasn't aware of that <laughs> yeah so it's like cool at the same time, like tragic. Do yeah. You, do you need this movie scene to, to you know, not do that? Well, it just proves this movie. You know, it 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 helped. You know, teach a generation of people just to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think some of the downfalls of this film are? Ooh. Let me see if I can even think of one. Brian, you got any? <laughs> I, I mean, truthfully, no. I, I mean, I guess if you wanted to nitpick the shit out of it, I mean, I, there could be, like we said, some more, more of the backstory to why everyone does know his name, uh, mm-hmm. more of what happened uh, when he, you know, killed that person. But at the same time, I mean, is it really, really necessary? It didn't take anything away from the film for me it just would just be nice to see more of it Mm -hmm. um yeah not really one that i could find a lot to sit there and complain about with this one um yeah i don't know i mean yeah i don't know i i felt like the cast like everyone was perfect for their character it was like front to end good music good action um i liked that it took place in like a small town because it was originally supposed to take place in like atlanta i don't think that would have had the same feel to it Hmm. um yeah i don't yeah because it makes it more it makes it more believable i don't think you could have it set in a place like Atlanta and make it believable that like this guy came in and saved it like that. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> JC Penny's coming to Atlanta yeah. because of me. <laughs> yeah, but it could it could have it could have it could have taken place like outside of Atlanta, like in Kennesaw. Well, I mean, sure. 
I, I don't think Jasper, Missouri was that far from Kansas City. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? You think there's something that could have been? I, I think they could have developed Sam Elliott's character a little bit more. Yeah. Why why did he walk with a limp when we first met him at the at the one bar? I took and, it as a war injury. Because wasn't that like a, a it, there was like a lot of uh, military guys in there and I just kind of took it for granted that maybe he used to be in the service. I mean, I could, that could be a major stretch there, but. Um, huh. Also, why was he so insistent that Dalton leave town? I th- I just kind of took that as, um, so something didn't happen like it happened last time, you know, where it's he ends up killing someone, which he ends up killing like 30 people. So it didn't really work out. But yeah, I just kind of took it as like, get out before this gets in over your head kind of deal. But yeah. uh, but at the same time, I, I will... it, it could have been something that was okay. cut. Also, why did the NWA Florida, the one time NWA Florida heavyweight championship <laughs> champion, two time Florida tag team champion one-time Florida television champion, one time of the Florida version of the NWA North American Tag Team Championship, the two-time NWA Southern Heavyweight Championship Florida version, um, the two-time ECW World Heavyweight Champion, one-time television champion, one-time NWA Georgia Tag Team Champion, (laughs) one-time NWA Georgia Television Champion, one day, one time, uh, NWA WCW United, two time United States heavyweight champion, two time, three time hardcore champion, um, one time Juggalo championship wrestling champion. Um, <laughs> Southwest heavyweight champion, uh, ch- ch- and WWF Tag Team Champion Terry Funk get an Oscar for this movie. Can you repeat those? I missed. I missed them. No. Yeah. There's... <laughs> no. No. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but Terry Funk is one of my favorite wrestlers, especially from his ECW days. Mm-hmm. When he made his debut as the color commentator on the first ECW episode, they showed a clip of him in 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 Roadhouse. <laughs> nice yeah i thought he was really good i it, there was a, even one point when i watched this last time where i was like man he's he's acting pretty well for a wrestler and then i remembered like this is literally all they do is just act what <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying matt <laughs> uh yeah i think he was i think he was like a really good choice to for that character i, I wish he had a bigger part now, was he always working for Ben Gazzara's character, or did he go there right after he was fired? Um, I'm trying to think. So the the scene where Dalton is reading, and he looks out his window and sees that big party happening, and they're all jumping into the pool, was that before or after he got fired? That was after he got fired. Okay. Because I saw him at the party, so yeah, I don't know. Um, well, it, it was probably before because when Dalton first goes into the to the double douche, um, Tinker is sitting there next to him. So they they had to have been uh, pals. Tinker's the polar bear guy. I, I really <laughs> wondered why Ben Gazar is – it seemed like he had a pretty legit empire himself that he didn't need a criminal empire. Uh I mean, isn't wasn't his empire just built off of crime though? I mean, wasn't he like extorting ten percent of everyone's revenue for his empire? You mean the charitable fund for the city? Yeah, the Jasper uh the Jasper Renovation Society or whatever. Yeah, that's pretty thuggish, but I mean he brought a he brought a mall and a JC Penny and just ask everyone in Jasper. <laughs> <laughs> He was also a music snob because when his girlfriend was aerobicizing, he said that music had no soul to it. Yeah. 
I did want to ask what you guys thought about, like, I, I, I did have to chuckle a little bit. So when Dalton finds his place that he's going to be staying, you know, and it appears to be like really remote, which would make sense. Like this guy kind of wants to stay off the, off the radar and everything. And then, you know, he's not even there for two minutes. And then we realize, oh, like the main bad guy's right across the pond, right there. There he is. Yeah. And then he's also he the the one girl who works at the double deuce, uh the brunette lady, she comes Harry, over and brings Harry him Ann. breakfast. Yeah, like the, the first morning <laughs> that he yeah. wakes up. He's like, How did you find me? It's like, oh, it's not hard to, you know, word gets around whatever small town kind of thing. But it's like there's there's literally I don't know, I just thought it was kind of funny that like, oh, there this dude is just everyone knows where he is all the time. Yeah. He's <laughs> placed right across from the main bad guy. Which I do say though, I mean, later on, you know, when that of course that closing fight scene and shit, you know, where he's holding that dude's body in the water, it calls for a really cool shot, you know, where he's just standing there like, you know, fuck you, you know, like um <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll tell you the scene I thought was the weirdest in the whole film is when Patrick Swayze was doing practicing his Tai Chi and Ben Gazar is on his dune buggy and is just <laughs> staring at him. <laughs> ben Gazar is always dressed like he's about to go on a on a safari. <laughs> safari. <laughs> now, I, I believe it's that same scene too though, Robert, where it's not only that, it's the uh uh God I feel bad, but the old guy that he's renting from. Uh Emmett, a pretty Emmett. Yeah, but yeah, I'm pretty sure in that same scene, he's out there just like, like, yeah. I don't, you know, like this, just like, he's looking at him like, what a God, or you know, like, what is this? That like, I mean, everyone is enamored with, with him in this town. Like, well, in Dalton, all the men want to be him and all the women want to get with him. <laughs> so, I did, I, mean, yeah. I did think of one uh, shortcoming that I would have changed. Um, and it is the it's a part of the script that happens many times but it's it's what it's specifically when a fight is about to happen and they exchange their like you know little little comment back to each other and they're just like they're so bad every time like when sam elliott first shows up to the double deuce the the like huge giant guy comes up and he's like he's like you want to fight dickless and sam elliott for some reason goes well i'm not going to show you my dick (laughs) <laughs> what well, whenever like, someone what? calls me dickless that's what i say before i fight them <laughs> and there was another one like but in that same scene at the at the river there with um with dalton and um jimmy 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 makes his comment like the fight's about to begin and dalton just says like you're such an asshole like i don't know it just it just seemed weird but then like just other lines throughout the movie like ben gazer at the end when he when he finds dalton in his in his trophy room he's like mm-hmm. um he's like i see you found my trophy room the only thing missing is your ass <laughs> <laughs> it's just like you know the movie the movie itself is overall like pretty serious and then it just seems weird when these like these little things are thrown in that just don't quite <laughs> don't quite match <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's also weird that the police didn't search the place because they easily would have found the guns at the end, especially mm-hmm. because Ben Gazzara's character owned them. He was paying yeah. them off. <laughs> uh huh. I, I did I really, think that was strange. Yeah. Um. So I, I kind of did this for shits and giggles last night. I ran. I ran a computer simulation of which ones which ones of us would die at the double deuce in a fight. Um, unfortunately, you two would be the ones that get killed, and I would run away. What about now that you see me, though, (laughs) (laughs) Matt? You're the first to die. (laughs) (laughs) You would be the first to die. Brian would go no, and then go for revenge. And while Brian is getting his ass kicked, I am running out the door. <laughs> wow. Sorry. I don't know. No, it's, I, no, it's fine. <laughs> no. It's true, though. I'm glad to know we mean so much to you. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, 
I I am needed for civilization. <laughs> <laughs> And right, don't worry, Brian. At your funeral, I would tell your wife that you died a hero. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, I would tell your wife that you went out like a bitch, <laughs> especially with that wig. That's fine. I'd be just being at the roadhouse would be enough, you know. Now, Robert would tell your wife, he'd be like, look, I know it's strange. He died heroically and everything, but he did say his last words were, give all of my, so- my partner labels to Robert. <laughs> his last words were, for some reason, well, I'm not going to show you my dick. <laughs> yeah, it's a line I say every day. <laughs> so... So one uh one thing that you guys got to decide on. I had this, I had this question with my buddy that watched the movie with me. Um, Brad Wesley's girlfriend or the doctor? The doctor. So, yeah, doctor. Oh, yeah, that's what I used to always no? think. But last couple of times I've watched it, Denise. No, <laughs> the woman who really? played Denise always played like a bimbo character in whatever TV or movie she's in. Uh, are, you, are you forgetting when she single-handedly led to the demise of Jason Voorhees? Yeah. Yeah. Kelly Lynch ever do that? <laughs> no, but Kelly Lynch was in better <laughs> movies. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Oh. How many... How many Mercedes would you give this film? <laughs> <laughs> Mine will be quick. I'll just jump in five all the way. Um, literally can't find anything that I dislike about the movie. I wish there was more of it. Um, and it just seems like <laughs> it just seems like one of those things where just everything goes right. Everything aligns. Perfect cast. Perfect music. Perfect story. And it's just, it's just a simple, simple good time. Five I would have, Mercedes with the wipers I would have on the headlights. Oh, yes, there we go. There we go. Yeah, I 100% agree. I, I actually like the way you worded that, that you wish there was more of it, because that is true. This is one of, this is one of those rare occasions where you find yourself watching a film and, and when it's ending, you're like, oh, keep going, you know? <laughs> um. Yeah, and also the way you worded it with it is, it's just a simple story, and I adore it for that. I thought it was a tremendous amount of fun. Um, yeah, nothing nothing to me that, that would make me give it any kind of negative score. Um, so yeah, five Mercedes Benzes with the headlights <laughs> and the whatever, all that shit, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will give it four and a half, only because there needs to be more Terry Funk in it. <laughs> and and he did not have a redemption arc, which he so so deserved he, that he deserved. Do you wish it would have been him in the role of the guy who was doing the girl in the closet? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Because that guy, that like the, the guy thing. who did that was pure and utter douchebag. Yeah, it, it's funny he never came back. He was I don't think he even played a, a henchman for Ben Gazzara. No. You're right. I don't, I don't, yeah, think, I don't so. think so either. <laughs> like he, he did not have... It would have been nice for him to come back and help Dalton out at the end. Mm-hmm. He goes... He could have had a line like, I like fucking women, but I also like fucking up bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian, what were you going to mention the other day when you said that... Um, talking about like what ruined... Well... <clears throat> I've thought a lot more about it since, Um, and I don't really, there's nothing I can really pinpoint, but I started thinking, like, when did movies like this stop being made? Now, before I even say what my initial thought was, you know, I wasn't thinking about, you know, we do still have some films, like, I guess John Wick, you can kind of throw in there as far as, like, oh, just like this super badass dude who just kicks ass all the time and stuff like that, but I feel like we just don't get many of them anymore that are just like you said, just like a nice, simple story about 
a character that is just super masculine and a badass. And I think they've been replaced ultimately with like superhero movies and stuff. I think that may be one yeah. of the reasons why we don't really get them. Um, I mean, I, I, again, we can also say this movie was a failure when it was released theatrically. Mm-hmm. I didn't. Fi- I mean, if the movie was a major success, we would have seen a real Roadhouse too, and not the direct video one that came out nearly thirty years after the original. Yeah, or twenty. I was years trying. Ago. I was trying to find the budget. But I I don't see it, but I do just see that it it did make sixty one million in theaters, but was more successful on home video. Mm. Um. So yeah, I don't know. It says it has grossed over two hundred three million. That's including physical media, though. So yeah, I don't know if it's. I don't know. The budget for it was fifteen million. Hmm. I mean, so it's a decent in theaters, I guess. But it wasn't. I mean, I I back then. I would have I would have seen it in the theater if it was like a major hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because in the eighties, the Sways only did one thing wrong, and that was Dirty Dancing. <laughs> I, I still haven't seen that one. Oh, that's the one thing you did wrong. No, there's only one movie. That, <laughs> there's only one movie that Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey co-star in, and that's called Red Dawn. When what year was that from? Was that before Dirty yeah. Dancing? Yeah, because yeah, it was way before Dirty Dancing because Red Dawn was the first PG thirteen movie ever released. Hmm. Really, that's interesting. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. And the guy who directed the remake of it was a famous Hollywood stunt coordinator who was also a bad guy in the very limited edition Executioner Part Two. <laughs> yes. Um, I was going to bring up something else. From that are you night. are you guys at all excited about the the reboot? <sighs> no, see Jake Gyllenhaal's in it, right? Yeah, and I and I like Jake Gyllenhaal, but I don't. I don't think this is like well they're, unless they're just going to do something completely different, which it looks like. But I don't know. I feel like uh, like a driver esque Ryan Gosling would have been like a good like strong but silent type for this. Yeah, I I think one of the things about Roadhouse was the era that it took place in. Mm-hmm. Um, it took place in the late eighties. There was no internet, and I, I and there really was no modern technology in there except for cars. Mm-hmm. It was a, as you said, a very simple film. I think if a character could go use the internet or pull up information of Dalton on his phone, it, it's not going to make sense because there was a hint of mystery to him. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he's supposedly an ex UFC fighter in the remake again ruins the mystique, yeah, of the character. And like every picture that I've seen of it, it's like in water, and it's like, <laughs> what is that? Well, Patrick Patrick Swayze is <laughs> in water in this film. And his well, last scene is we see him yeah. swimming with Kelly Lynch. Yeah, but I mean, this looks like it's taking place on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Oat house. <laughs> <laughs> I just guys, hope that it's not like. Guys, like what, they... what if it's a bar like the Porky's Boat in Porky's Three? <laughs> <laughs> that could be all right. <laughs> I, don't know. I, just, I, I, I think they're going to go the same direction that they did with the with the Point Break one, where they're just like really just trying to amp it up and. Uh, hold on, hold on, Matt. The mm-hmm. Point Break remake does not exist. It is oh, not a no, real no. movie. <laughs> no one I know has I actually seen mistake. it. <laughs> did you did you see it? Did you pay money to go see it? Did you buy it? I um <clears throat> I rented it. 
and it I, magically appeared on my Plex somehow. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen it. Because yeah, it spent, doesn't exist and you're a good human being. They'll spend about $1. fifty on it from the Red Box. I, I mean, there should be yeah. there, there should be a rule. If you're going to remake a movie, at least try to remake it better. Mm-hmm. Or make it a continuation of like Scream wasn't a reboot, it was a requel. And I think that's the way to go. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. I, di- I haven't actually read anything about. I've only seen like one picture, you know, of you know Roadhouse reboot, and I haven't read anything, so I didn't know anything about uh, Jake Gyllenhaal being an ex UFC fighter. I don't know. It, it's instantly giving me like not good vibes. Like if that sounds mm-hmm. like it's just going to be too like bro or something i don't know does that make sense like connor, connor mcgregor <laughs> is the the main villain and it just yeah i mean it's definitely being made for like this newest generation but how is yeah. connor mcgregor in it he's not allowed in the states i don't know hmm. did he get banned um they were doing a, he was supposed to be doing some stuff with wwe with uh drew mcintyre and Roman Reigns because they he made an appearance at Clash of the Castle back in September, and they've been saying he can't come in to the states to do anything because he is prohibited. Yeah, I don't know. Huh. Have you guys ever seen the actual sequel to Roadhouse? No. Roadhouse Two: Last Call. No. It was um, it was decent. It's it's uh, it's about. Uh, Dalton's son, who who teaches, uh, who Dalton teaches everything he knows, and then he pretty much grows up to live the same life. Is the um, mom the doctor? Um, I don't think it says. It's very like. There's just one scene that calls back to even having Dalton, in it, and it's like his. It's supposed to be like Dalton's shadow, saying stuff to the main. To the main person when he's a kid and that's like it but um when did this come out like 2009 um i just saw it here 2006, 2006. So yeah, it was... wow i had no idea it even existed i'll be honest yeah it, it went straight to dvd you don't say <laughs> i'll be dead. Um, <laughs> before we go um I'm going to propose our next week's movie. Roadhouse 2. No. I want. To, I think we should watch Invisible Maniac or Freeway. Ooh. I haven't seen either of them, so I'm good with both. Which one? You have any preference, Brian? I, I, I have watched them both. Uh, let's do Invisible Maniac. All right. Cool. 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 Um, have you guys watched anything good this week besides Roadhouse? Um, I don't know what I mentioned last week, but I did watch, um, did I already say that I watched the 1977 Spider-Man? You mean the made for TV one starring Nicholas Hammond? Mm-hmm. The like no. pilot episode that was like a, a pilot movie. Man, no. that was, that was better than the newest Spider-Man movie. That came Fuck out. you. <laughs> it, was, it was so good and so enjoyable. Fuck you. It wasn't. <laughs> It I wasn't. watched that. Um, I think I already talked about the rest. Yeah, the menu we already kind of talked about. So yeah, that's that was about it for me. I didn't get to do too much. I watched this cooking show on Netflix all week, pretty much. Lame. I know. It's pretty good, it's pretty good though. <laughs> what What about you, Brian? <laughs> uh, let's see. Last night we watched Glass Onion. Finally got that one. Um. I watched one from uh, Tempe Digital called Chupa. Uh, uh, pretty good. Chupa Cobra horror, SOV horror film. Thought it was pretty fun. Uh, I, we went on Friday and watched Skin of Marink in the theater, um, which is a title that I'm extremely excited to discuss with people. Um, it will definitely, like 100%, it will not work for everyone. And I did a little me- bit of... Huh? When's it coming out of Shutter? 
I don't know for sure. I think here in a couple of months, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an experimental horror film. Um, it is, I think most people will find it to be very, very, very boring. Um, I did a little bit of research on it because I was intrigued on, there were segments of it that really worked for me. And when I say really worked, I mean, like, I'm hard pressed to think of a film that made me actually feel like genuinely terrified. There were moments in this movie that I was just an absolute nervous wreck. It piqued my anxiety and it really fucked with me. So after some research, basically what this guy has done, I can't remember the director's name, but he would make short films. People would send him their nightmares. Like, Hey, I had this nightmare, blah, blah. blah and he would, you know, sort of, make some short films about it and that's very much i think why it worked for me because when i was sitting there watching i was like this is what my fucking dreams look like like really dark and shit um it, it's it's very difficult to watch or very difficult to discuss without someone watching it like my wife hated it um everything i see online is is really 50 50 it seems like there's there's an audience for it and then there's not i just so happen to be an audience for it <laughs> um, i'll watch when it comes on shutter the only theater it's playing it out here is one where I'd have to pay for parking, and I'm not going to oh, pay for bullshit. parking. That's bullshit, yeah. It's not going to pay for parking and a ticket. <laughs> I did see that we did get a showing, so I might try and see it someday this week. One showing per day. Mm. I was very surprised at the amount of people in the theater. I mean, it wasn't sold out, but it was, it was pretty packed. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it's because the, the, I think Terrifier 2 showed that there's a market for original horror films. Not saying the terrible. This is definitely original. <laughs> um, I'm excited to hear your all's thoughts on it. Like, like I said, it's if you if you tend to get bored easily, then you're probably going to despise it. It comes across very artsy in that way, but again, it visually just worked for me, and I thought there was some really really scary shit in it. <clears throat> nice. That's cool. I watched four interesting films this week. I, mean, I watched a lot more than that, but four really interesting ones. I rewatched New Year's Evil because I didn't know where I put it for New Year's Eve, and I went out New Year's Eve. So I watched that. I, I, I never upgraded to the Kino one. I still have the Shout Fact Scream Factory. I don't think I need to upgrade it, but man, it's a really it, that it's a great thriller. Mm-hmm. Um, then I watched uh, the movie Gotcha. Starring Anthony Edwards. Mm. Um, basically, I don't think I know about that one. It's a guy who plays the assassination game in college, goes to Europe, meets a girl. Um, turns out she's a spy. Danger, uh, danger and intrigue happen throughout the rest of the film. It's pretty good. And then I watched one. I, I'm going through my collection trying to find stuff that I haven't even opened and opening them. Uh, it was a code red Blu-ray called Corrupt. The other you know, the, the other title for it is Cop Killer. It's an Italian directed movie by uh, Roberto Fenza, and it stars Harvey Keitel and Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols. Mm-hmm. Um, Harvey Keitel plays a corrupt cop. Johnny Rotten may or may not play a person who's been murdering cops. And basically, it's a cat and mouse game between the two where Harvey Keitel has him imprisoned in his apartment. And this movie had no right to be as good as it was. (laughs) And it makes me disappointed that Code Red released it. There was only one special feature on there an interview with one of the minor actors and it would have been nice to have a ton of supplements to tell the story of this movie and why it was Johnny Rotten's only real acting role in film. What was it called? Uh, Corrupt. Corrupt. I believe it's out of print. I mean, who knows what the state of the Code Red, uh, code red is now that bill's dead yeah there's been no no news about it released or anything 
I have a feeling Bill was a guy who did not keep proper records. <laughs> very, very possible. I mean, I'm sure Dark Force will be releasing, re-releasing some stuff, and same thing with Scorpion. But, yeah, that's about it. I did I'm, remember that I finally watched uh, Don't Worry, Darling. I'm sorry. You guys see that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't like it? I thought it was pretty interesting. It was so predictable. <laughs> I thought it was okay. It, it um, I it kind of started to lose me towards the end. But mm. yeah, it was a really bad take on the Stepford Wives. Yeah, there is that, but I did think it was a really good like commentary on, um, you know, these people that are. Just the way that just things that are happening in our culture today with with these um, influencers just like trying to to mold people into, you know, 1950s, <laughs> you know, no, kind of this, ideals and stuff. This, this, this movie was every incel's wet dream. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I really can't take you seriously with all those pubes on your head right now. You're coming out of my actual scalp. <laughs> Dude, your scalp is going to be so itchy and gross when you take that off. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to ask, does your wife make you wear that now when you guys make the whoopee in? <laughs> <laughs> she said I need to style it. It is getting, It's as time goes on, it's definitely getting less and less Roadhouse. <laughs> was that called the, was that the Dalt, official Dalton wig? No, I couldn't find one. This was just this was in the pictures. This one looked the closest, and it it definitely does not look like what it looks like in the pictures. But yeah, this one's like called your, the. Uh, it looks like your Madge from the beauty parlor. This one's called the the brown short <laughs> wavy shaggy style. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> that's the that, that's the new name of our podcast. <laughs> Uh, we will see you guys next week with more jokes, more fun as we talk about Riff Coogan's classic, The Invisible Maniac. Until then, keep supporting physical media. Keep supporting us by hitting subscribe. By the time this comes out, all of our episodes will finally be up. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've been getting some views. We're, we're hitting the 50s. Yes. Yeah. We're overdue for a uh... Uh, musical performance. Yeah, Brian, have you learned the song on guitar yet? <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. I'll I, I'll actually see if I can if I can work on that a little bit this week. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, and then when we do that, we'll discuss champagne and bullets as well. Nice. nice. All right, we'll <laughs> see you guys all next time. See you Bye. guys. See ya. <laughs>